We caught up with Dan from Atlas and Co to hear what's new in the Atlas Orion anamorphic series and much more. You're watching Synity, supported by B and H and CVP. Hi, I'm Johnny from Synity, and I'm here with Dan from Atlas. Dan, how are you? Great to see you, Johnny. How are you? Thank you very much. Um, I'm well. This is day zero. This is quite a mess around here. It's really crazy. Tomorrow, it's all going to be nice and tidy. You better and, believe it. And, and even the booth is not ready yet, but still we want to talk about some of your new products. But for those who maybe never heard about your company, what actually Atlas is doing? So Atlas Lens Co. is the only American cinema lens manufacturer selling cinema lenses. Of course, there's greats like Panavision, but Panavision is primarily focused on making lenses for rental and camera systems for rental. And to us, they're a huge inspiration and a world-class organization, uh, but we're the only American lens manufacturer selling cinema lenses. When you say cinema lenses, you probably referring to anamorphic mostly, no? Well, we love all kinds of cinema lenses, but Atlas primarily focuses on anamorphic cinema lenses. And if you're unfamiliar with an anamorphic cinema lens, it's a lens that gives you a wider angle field of view in the horizontal aspect than the vertical aspect. And you can think of it as a hardware codec. It's actually compressing a wide field of view onto a narrower piece of film or a narrow area of a sensor to give you a panoramic image. Good, but we, I also want to talk, of course, about uh, your add-on new lenses. Let's yeah. talk, uh, first of all, about the Orion series in general. How many lenses do you have in, in, the, in the line already, and what is the squeeze uh, factor? Thank you for asking. So, it's interesting. Seven years ago was actually our debut here at NAB. We were a guest of Tiffin, who hosted us. Thank you so much, Tiffin, for helping us get our start. We're a, still a, st a small startup, but um, the Orion series, we debuted seven years ago with only three lenses in the family and as a startup our minimum viable plan was to make three lenses the 40 millimeter orion the 65 millimeter orion and the 100 millimeter orion and we chose these focal lengths because these are core focal lengths that would allow anyone to make a feature film start to finish with just three lenses that's one of the best things about an anamorphic lens is that you get two fields of view for any given lens, so you can actually tell more story in any given frame with just one lens. That's pretty cool. Uh, and all of the Orion series, barring the longest lenses, are T2. So the new 135 is a T2.2, and the 200 is a T3.2. All the other Orions, which are 12 lenses in total, are T2. So we have a 18 millimeter T2, which is the world's widest shipping anamorphic lens. We have the 21 millimeter, which was previously the world's widest shipping anamorphic lens. So that's two world's firsts. We have a 25 millimeter Orion T2. We have a 28 millimeter Orion T2. And the other question, because I promised two questions, it's about the 18 millimeter lens. As you said, this is the widest anamorphic lens in the world. Yes. What type of challenges did you went through, did you go through in order to produce such a lens? There were things that we learned in the technical development process of building the 25 millimeter that through analysis we learned we can actually implement some techniques to make an even wider lens. That's how we made the 21. We also realized people would love to have a 28. So if we make some adjustments to the overall optical formula, we can make a 28 millimeter. And by taking it to an extreme, we can go even further and make an 18 millimeter. And so, you know, initially, at the onset, you might say, well, an 18 millimeter, that's such a bold jump, right? It's a moonshot project. When we started Atlas and when we started making Orions, we weren't thinking our next goal is to make a 18 millimeter anamorphic lens. We took steps, every step very cautiously, with good clarity of thinking, talking to our users, using the lenses a lot, doing a lot of design process and engineering process and all of the things we learned along that process allowed us to do the 18. And I would encourage everyone anywhere in your career, think about your filmmaking process as a prototype. Every film that we make is a prototype of the perfect film. Every take that we make is a prototype for the perfect take and be okay with iterating and improving as you go. And that's exactly what we did. That's what being a filmmaker taught me is 
be aware, be locked in with what you're doing, connect with everyone you're working with and understand the processes and then improve over time gradually. And so that's our secret sauce. Nice. Now, one second. Wait, I, I, I have to change lens. Is that locked? This is locked. Yep. Wait, I want to show my master. One second, one second, not so fast. I didn't want you to hurt yourself. So, this is the 135 millimeter. Mm -hmm. It's a beast. It's almost like a portable fitness center. You, that meant to be like this, and what I want to ask actually, if you can help me and take the other 138. Uh, yes. So, at the end, look at the difference. There is a difference here. Um, more glass or heavier lens means better quality or not? No, oh, I love that let, question. Let me, let, let me just put here. I love that question, Johnny, because uh, your question to recap is, the bigger and the heavier the lens, the better? Not always. Uh, lenses are not necessarily something like a computer where you can spec it and say, oh, you know, mine has four gigahertz and I have 800 megabytes of RAM. It's a combination of the technical qualities as well as the creative qualities and capabilities of the lens. And so this is our Mercury series 138 millimeter lens. This lens covers larger than full frame. So this will cover full frame and beyond even out to GFX 100 uh, Fujifilm sensor 44 by 33 sensor. It's smaller than the 135 T 2.2 Orion. This is a T 2.6, but it does have a larger image circle. So if we think of lens design as a balloon, you can push on certain parts of the balloon and change different characteristics. The Mercury lens has a 1.5 anamorphic squeeze. It also has a completely unique patented optical design architecture that allows us to make it lighter, smaller, easier to use in some ways. Um, but what's crazy is that there are not a lot of 135 millimeter anamorphic lenses in the world and there are no 135 anamorphic lenses that are this fast. So this is a very fast lens. It's of course faster means uh, more light bigger. transmission. Yeah, yeah, bigger entrance pupil. The mechanics needed to move these larger optics are of course larger, so that makes it large. It looks huge. What would you say if I told you that this only weighs around nine pounds or four and a half kilos approximately? So that's the question. It's a fitness center membership or the lens? I'd say this is a better investment long term Absolutely. because uh, you know you can use it for both. Just get your reps in, get your rep to get you a new job shooting something. You're a cinematography rep, and have a great uh, have a great life, have a great shoot. Right? They go together. Let, let's go back to a serious questions, and I'm sorry if I'm a bit kind of off topic. Expanders. Tell me a little bit about the expanders and why do you have two of those? Yes. Okay. So great question. So the image expanders that we have do two things. Not only do they enlarge the image circle, but they're magnifying the image. So you can think about them as a telephoto extender or a telephoto expander. So if you have something like a 200 millimeter Orion with a 1.6, you end up with a 320 millimeter. Now this lens already covers full frame sensors edge to edge, but what you're doing is enlarging the image circle and expanding the image. So if you're using it on a 35 millimeter sensor, your effective focal length is still 320. So a lens is a lens is a lens. That's something we also need to get out of the way is that sometimes people say, well, what is the lens on a full frame sensor? What is the lens on a micro four thirds sensor? A lens is always the focal length defined on the lens because that's by design. It's the position of the exit pupil relative to the image plane that defines that. We could use something different to measure that, which would be field of view or angle of view. Those numbers get really wonky, so it's very hard to manage. So we use focal length numbers as a shorthand for communicating um, how wide of a field of view a lens has. So sorry, that's a bit of a ramble, but in a nutshell, these image expanders will allow you to magnify the image and either cover a larger sensor or have a larger magnification if you're staying on a standard sensor. So it but has two purposes. Why do we have two? Uh, the 1.4 times expander is an improvement and iteration on the 1.6 times expander. We actually call the 1.6 an extender to try to help differentiate mentally, but it does both. They both do both extension and expansion. 
Um, and there's different ways of achieving image expansion and image extension, but effectively you're getting both always. So a quick, a quick side note, the 1.6 was our first expansion product and that one will cover larger than full frame sensors. Uh, but if you're using something that has a smaller image circle, it's only going to be looking, so to speak, at a four perf uh, look around area and en enlarging that. So there may be rays that fall outside of that bundle that are not being uh, transmitted through the system. They can come become aberrations like spherical aberration or like a light glow, but these are specific to our lenses, they'll work with other lenses. The 1.4 times is an enhancement beyond the 1.6 in that you also have back focus adjustment built into the lens, into the expander. So if you're working with a camera that's not back focused correctly, you have a little bit of tolerance adjustment to improve the quality of the image. But beyond that, you also have the ability to intentionally detune a lens. And we have a numerical scale that you can read out on that expander. So if you say, uh, oh, I really love the lens of that uh, Super Baltar 50 millimeter, and I put it on my 1.4 expander, uh, it becomes a 70 millimeter effective focal length. You lose one stop of light transmission, and you adjust that back focus. If you intentionally throw out the back focus, it's going to give you a slightly different look. Maybe you like that look. You can write that look down in your notebook and say, okay, I love negative two. Or you might say, I love positive four for this specific scene, and then you can dial it back. So it's a dialable look adjustment, uh, which is a second order consequence. It's not the primary design concept, but it's a second order benefit that the, the product offers. And you were also mentioning light loss. So something people are really afraid of sometimes with expanders and extenders is losing a stop. In today's era, I see people indoors with low key lighting needing to add neutral density filter because the cameras are so sensitive. When you have a camera that has a base sensitivity of over 5,000 ISO as an option, um, it doesn't hurt to lose a stop of light in transmission. It might open up new aesthetic possibilities. But of course, I'm, I am uh, empathetic to people that are also concerned about that. So, you know, it is one stop of light with a 1.4. It's one and one third stops with a 1.6. Just something to be aware of. But another thing that people have as a misconception is that um, when your stop changes with the expander, it's changing your depth of field properties. It's not your T-stop, which is your true distribution of the light, your true light transmission, changes. It gets slightly darker. But your F-stop, which is your overall appearance of the image, doesn't change. So your bokeh will still remain big and beautiful. In fact, it'll be enlarged because you're enlarging the image circle and enlarging the image by magnifying it. So you have bigger bokeh at any given shot size and uh, it looks beautiful. So don't worry about the bokeh. Good, so we are much wiser now and I'm very thankful for that. But one question, last question, which is on my mind is the competition. When you started the business, your niche was very unique, meaning you really aim to end users. Now with so much competition, you have so many products. It's, you know, quality is a matter of taste, let's call it. But of course, uh, budget is a big concern. What is your take about this type of competition? Are you concerned? Are you happy? You will try to match? How, how do you deal with this as a business owner? I love that question because uh, I believe in capitalism and freedom. And our goal is not to be at the whim of others. So. When we started this company, we started it because we believe in making exceptional anamorphic lenses that change the possibilities for filmmakers. Nothing has changed in that regard in the last seven years, except that our passion, our clarity, our understanding of how to do that has improved and will always continue to improve. And so I think it's very interesting to see other people in the world seeing the success of Atlas, seeing how filmmakers around the world have embraced the beautiful products that we make and that we bring forward to celebrate our filmmakers. And in doing so, maybe they are aspiring themselves to match what we've done. And of course, you know, prices are very relevant. So in a world where 
all of us are facing macroeconomic conditions that are suboptimal around the world. Everybody is seeking to have a leg up. Our key strength and our leg up in this world is step-by-step -step innovation, passion, development, and clarity of vision. So, uh, you know, others made anamorphic lenses before us. We love all the people that made anamorphic lenses before us. That's why we make anamorphic lenses. So, in essence, I'm proud to say we've been inspired and are standing on the shoulders of giants like Panavision, companies like Bosch and Loam, companies like JDC, Joe Dunton, companies like Technovision, Shiga, Koa in Japan, companies like Sigma in Japan, Canon, Nikon. I feel so grateful to be a part of this world that I'm not afraid of competition. I think that it's a sign of uh, the beauty of what we've done to see people trying to imitate what we've done in a way. And maybe they'll innovate in their own ways too. And I believe that our innovation is so strong, it will outlast. Then, thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you. Guys, thank you very much for watching. I hope you, you know, enjoyed, but also learned a little bit. I learned for sure.